Welcome to Wisdom for Life, where we sift through philosophy to find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Hayes. I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Greg Sadler. And today we have a special guest, Donald Robertson. We're talking about... Rebuilding Plato's Academy, and Donald will be telling us all about this. Uh, those who've been listening to us for a while have heard us uh, mentioning Donald from time to time. He is uh, a very important figure in the modern Stoic movement, which we're going to talk about a bit as well. But uh, he's also got a, a very interesting new project going. So welcome to the show, Donald. It's really great to have you here. Uh, it's a real treat for all of us. Well, hello. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Dan. And uh, I hope you were saying nice things about me, Greg, <laughs> when I wasn't around. Like, but I trust you, buddy, so I'm sure you were. I'm looking forward to our chat today because, like you said, we've got a, a bunch of different things we could potentially talk about. So anything could happen. Yeah, and this, by the way, is our 50th episode of the Wisdom for Life show, so it's kind of a fun milestone as well. So we should do some introductions first. Um, Donald Robertson is a cognitive behavior therapy practitioner. He's an author, a speaker. He is a founding member of what eventually became known as the Modern Stoicism Organization. And he's organized some of the big Stoicon conferences, which uh, listeners of the show have heard us talk about. And I think that you've spoken at pretty much every one of them, right? There, has there been one where you, there was one we were talking about earlier where it, you got held up at the border and almost didn't make it in, <laughs> but you did make it in. I made it there. And then I think I've spoken, I don't know, I might have spoken uh, I think I've spoken about too many of them. Like, I think the people are getting perfect. I'll have to come up with some new things to talk about. But I've spoken at a lot of conferences. <laughs> and I was going to say, like, I've done a lot of podcasts. Somebody, this yeah. this guy that I know sent me a playlist. And he was like, Donald, I've made this playlist of all the podcasts you've done. And there was over 100 on it. I didn't realize that I'd done that many of them over the past couple of years or whatever. That but I correct, I'm not getting any better. I'm getting worse, I think, though. Oh, on the but, podcast, you mean? Yeah, yeah. So. I'm getting older, like I ramble, you know. Sometimes <laughs> I use expletives, like, but honestly, uh, yeah. you, you think you would improve, like, a, it, with like a fine line or something. Podcasts but, are like cable TV, though. You can you can say whatever you want on them, and they're not gonna. The FCC is not gonna get on your case. Whereas, like the radio show, like we're doing here, you know, obviously we have to stick with the uh, don't say the seven deadly words. Um, I, I do want to finish the rest of the introduction uh, for, for Donald, though, um, for people who don't haven't haven't seen his stuff. He, he created one of the largest online stoic communities that's been going now for quite a while, a massive Facebook group, which uh, I know has been a lot of work uh, for you over the years. He's also the author of a number of books. I'll just mention three of them. Stoicism, the Art of Happiness, Practical Wisdom for Everyday Life. Uh, the philosophy of cognitive behavior therapy, Stoic philosophy is rational and cognitive psychotherapy, and then uh, very well done, Greg. You said the full title there. Yeah, well, I, a mouthful. I've got it right there in front of me. Well, it's, a, it's one of the longest <laughs> book titles in history. Is it really? <laughs> I think so. I like to I like to tell myself that. Well, your 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 other one's pretty long too. How to think like a Roman emperor: the Stoic philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. That's uh, pretty sizable, right? So, I have to do so, that. Because in case people thought I was talking about another Roman emperor, it's sneaky. Oh, it tricks up light. So I thought yeah, I say, yeah. how to think a Roman emperor, and they think, well, it's like Caligula or something. Mm. And then I say, no, read the subtitle, and they go, oh, right, yeah, you're right. So, is it you that is the big fan of the subtitles, or is that your publisher? I think it's me. Like I think that my, I think my publishers are kind of somewhat a little bit. They do. They're not super keen on my book titles, like usually. But I'll tell you a little story about that. Like, sure. A uh, long time ago. I the very first book proposal I did, it was turned down um, by this kind of psychotherapy panel that were looking to publish books. And then the acquiring editor told me to send it straight to the publishing house, and I did, and they turned it down as well. So I was a businessman at the time. I ran a training school. I, I phoned up the publisher and I said, hey, what kind of books do you want people to write? And they said, we'd like someone to write a book about philosophy and cognitive behavioral therapy. So I changed the title of the book to the philosophy of cognitive behavioral therapy. And I sent them the same proposal back and they faxed me back my first book contract. But that book 
was called How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. And it took me like 12 years or something like that before I got a chance to pitch another book with the same title. And it was published and it did really well. And it's been published, it's translated into 18 languages now. And uh, I think the title worked really well, but it was turned down and it took me like 10 or 15 years before I got a chance to, for, to get a publisher to accept it. Well, there, I think there's a lot of stories out there about, um, on the one hand, manuscripts that go to publisher after publisher after publisher getting rejected constantly, and then finally something clicks. And then, yeah, there's there's a lot of um, projects where it really depends on how you pitch it, doesn't it? It's the, there's an art to it. I'm always a bit suspicious. I was a, a, a thing about positive psychology, and there was mm -hmm. a guy giving this kind of motivational speech in England years ago. And he told a story about how he wrote a self-help book with his business partner about positive psychology. And he said he submitted it to a publishing house and he turned it down. He submitted it to another one, he submitted it to another one. And he submitted it to like 50 publishers before it was finally accepted. Yeah. And, and he goes, and so the moral of this story is, you know, you like William Wallace, you know, if at first you don't, or Robert Bruce, if at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again, right? And everyone stood up and, and clapped. And I turned around and looked at my, my wife at the time and then she was looking at me and we were both like, this is the stupidest story I've ever had in my life. Because like, if he's got turned down 50 times, like, you know, maybe like there's something wrong with the book. Like, and maybe he's kind of scraping the barrel now for publishing houses that would publish it, you know? So like, normally if I sent, if I sent a, a proposal in and the publisher turned it down two or three times, I'd probably ask them why they were turning it down. Why? And then normally you'd have a little conversation and maybe you'd kind of like adjust the proposal or whatever. That's an example of somebody doing something and it doesn't work and then they just keep doing it, which normally these guys tell you is like a bad strategy in life. You yeah, know, yeah. it's better to get feedback and adapt to it and stuff like that. So I thought, what happened to the whole thing about getting feedback and figuring out what it was you're doing wrong and learning from it? No, just keep doing the same thing 50 times. Like that was it. Anyway, that was that good strategy. And I thought that, that I don't I don't think that's a good strategy for getting books published. But hey, you know, what would I know? It's probably not a good strategy in general, right? They've got a quip about uh, yeah. madness is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. That was as Heidegger said. Was it Heidegger? No, no I don't know. Definitely not. I've heard that attributed to Einstein, but who knows? You know, the, I think that's one of those quotes that just kind of floats around. Yeah, it's like folk wisdom or something, I think. For like there there is this, this passage in Epictetus that I really, really like because you do see a lot of people in the Stoic community saying, just keep at it. Don't don't allow anything to get you down. And he says stubbornness is not uh, the same thing as, as prudence. So the, he was talking about some guy who decided to do something and it was something bad and he stuck to it. And people are saying, oh, look at this guy. He's persevering. And Epictetus says, no, he's not. This is just uh, foolishness, you know? You have to actually have something good that you decide on and then keep sticking to it over and over again. If you're just if you're just deciding to, I don't know, uh, go to the gym and lift too many weights, you know, you're not actually getting any better at things doing that or, you know, walk in front of cars and, you know, expect the cars to stop. That, that, that's just foolishness. Epictetus kind of, was a cool guy. Yeah. Makes me think a little bit of, you know, kind of the idea of, of praxis here. We have theory plus practice. And if you're just practicing away without any theory, then you're not going to actually, you know, make any progress towards something that you actually, a goal that you're looking for. Um, although, I guess a, a counterexample would be uh, Dune. And Frank Herbert uh, basically exhausted every single uh, publishing house that actually published novels. So he went to um, oh, another one that right, an automotive even... manufacturer, right? Yeah. yeah. And... and, and and somehow they, they found this. And so either you've got something that's so um, kind of transformative um, that people don't realize it's, it's greatness or you're doing something wrong. Um, and the question how is, you, how do you determine the difference? Yeah, exactly. How, how can you tell the difference between those two? I could, you're right. It could be that this did self-help book about positive psychology with it was an epoch making masterpiece that has, <laughs> was simply like ages beyond its time or something like that. I think, but maybe, maybe not. It may not have been. But they, I didn't know that about Frank Herbert. There are, there are I, will, I will happily concede that there are some authors that that strategy works out for. Um, I was going to say, you know, like sometimes people say, if you could go back in time, if you could go back in time, don't yeah. you? You could speak to any philosopher that's been dead for a long time. Like, who would you want to have a beer with or something like that? Is something that people sometimes ask on, on podcasts. 
Have you ever asked anyone that question, Greg? Um, no, I've never asked anyone that question, but I have, have been, been asked it. I have been asked that question, and I have a hard time answering it because I know I, I it's, a, it's a difficult question, right? Yeah. Who, did, Especially did, if you can't speak the same language. Yeah, like that would make it awkward. It would be like awkward silence. And they might not. They might not like beer too. You know, like if we I like Marcus drinks. Aurelius, but honestly, I don't think he would be much fun to have a beer with or whatever. Like he was a bit. He was kind of quite. A, he was a little bit stiff and a little bit of a nerdy kind of guy. Socrates yeah. would be awesome. But the thing that I really want to go back and see is allegedly. And this is in one of these kind of chunky Roman histories that we don't trust that much. I think, if I remember rightly, it's in the history of Augusta, but it might be true. Like, there's, it says um, that Hadrian was besties with Epictetus, yeah, the Emperor I, I, Hadrian, I, I, yeah, which is the most like the odd couple, right? <laughs> like, it's the most <laughs> unlikely like thing yeah. in my mind. Hadrian, like, who is one of the most arrogant men in history. Like, and, and Epictetus, who's always going on about not flattering tyrants and stuff like that. And the idea of these two guys having a chin wag, I would love to be a fly in the wall. Because I don't actually, I don't, I don't actually believe that. Like, I think hey, maybe Hadrian told everyone that Epictetus was his bestie, and Epictetus was like, oh my god, not that guy. Like, or Epictetus didn't even know that he was saying it. Perhaps. He's like Hadrian. Epictetus is like Hadrian who. You know, it's it's funny because it, it brings to mind um, the you know famous encounter between Alexander and Diogenes, um, and and we we find these texts later on that are, have to be com they they can't possibly be the actual uh, dialogues um, like uh, Dio Cassian telling us that the the discourses between the two of them and maybe they had some sort of contact with each other right um, who knows. Uh, it's, but, you're, but you're right, to be a fly on the wall, you know, to actually get to hear it. I'll tell you some, something about Diogenes the Cynic, right? So yeah. he didn't, the, the, they can't even agree about whether he wrote any books or not, right? So he may have written, but he didn't leave any behind, right? right. Um, but we have all these anecdotes and stuff about him. Now, where do those anecdotes come from? Well, we know, like, because several of the historians tell us that a bunch of them come from satires, right? So we're literally told that they were only joking <laughs> like, when they said a lot of these things. They're satirical plays, yeah. right? Um, and yet we kind of treat them as if they're literal truth. So some of them maybe are, or even satires can be kind of grounded. Sometimes there are things there that, satires that truth, end up yeah, yeah, yeah. turning out to, to be true. But we, we should bear that in mind when we're listening to stories about Diogenes the Cynic, is that they, a lot of what we, all that we know about him really are these anecdotes and a number of them, and possibly more than we realized seem to come from satirical plays. Yeah. So to finish up your introduction here, <laughs> uh, good 15 minutes in the show, um, you've also got a, a brand new project, the, uh, the new Plato's Academy. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I was saying to Greg earlier, like the, we, so, so I was saying how it happened that we got into doing this thing and it was because I was in Athens and I was doing a lot of podcasts and people would say to me, where are you, Donald? And I'd say, oh, I'm in Athens and Greece. And they'd say, well, what, tell us a bit about it. What have you been doing? So I'd say, I could say, well, I just went and got a kebab or whatever. But I'd say, well, something more interesting. Well, I went the other day to Plato's Academy Park, right? And they'd say, what's that like? And then I'd get all animated and I'd kind of shut my mouth off. And I'd say, well, I just couldn't believe that there isn't really much, that much there. Like, I thought there should be an international conference center at the original location of Plato's Academy. That seems like a no-brainer to me, right? And it's an economically deprived area. There's a, a little digital museum, and there's a statue of Plato, and there are ruins there. It's a recreational mm -hmm. ground that all the Athenians, but not that many tourists go there. But there's nothing um, much else there. And there could be, who wouldn't want to go to a conference at the original location of Plato's Academy? Everybody, everybody's heard of it. It's like Coca-Cola. Like, everyone's heard of the Academy, if only because every other Academy is uh, name checking it, like is named after it. Yeah. So I kind of said that enough times that people, and I was only kind of shooting my mouth off. And then <laughs> people started emailing me and stuff and saying, oh, like, I'd, I'd be interested in um, kind of like supporting that project or like offering, like investing in it. And, uh, and then luckily, because I know a lot of people in Greece and stuff, I know um, I'm good friends with, 
the general manager of the American School for Classical Studies in Athens, which is the main foreign archaeological institute in Athens, Pantelis Panos. And uh, I, so I sat and had coffee and I was chatting to him about it. I said, tell us, I've been, sh- I've been shooting my mouth off on podcasts and I've been talking about how there should be an international conference in at the Players Academy. Like, don't you think that's a crazy idea? And he said, no, that's quite a good idea. Like, and then we, we got other people involved. Luckily, I know a guy who's a, a chartered surveyor who specialises in these kind of things. And I realised I kind of knew a lot of people. Um, and then before long, and I say before long because we, we, we're still just about to incorporate. We, um, our incorporation sh- is pretty much done. It should be uh, finished like in the next few days. But we already now have seed funding. We're enrolled in an incubator program. We've got a whole board of advisors with a bunch of senior academics and, and authors and stuff. Um, we're already running several events or involved in running several major events in Athens next year. And we set up our website and all our social media accounts. We just had 2,000 people enroll in our email list and 500 people over the weekend joined the the group that we just set up. So everything just kind of exploded, really. And then the more we got people on board, the more they started telling, they started shooting their mouths off from podcasts about like, And then everyone else would start talking about And then people would say to me, when I talked to them, they'd say, hey, whatever happened to that Plato's Academy thing that you mentioned? And we'd be like, well, we're, we're kind of like started doing it, actually. You know, um, we're in the process of doing it. Now, I said we should rebuild Plato's Academy. And then, but I was kind of speaking somewhat figuratively because like we don't know exactly what it looked like or where exactly where it was. But we know the roughly, like, I should explain. Here, we'll have a little mini history lesson, right? So Athens had three gymnasia. Like and so we call a gymnasium like what like kind of sports hall, mm-hmm. right? Um, but a gymnasium in ancient Greece is more like what we would call a recreational ground, it's a park. Like, and within it there would be a palestra, or like or a wrestling school, there'd be a running track, there'd be streams and walks. And weirdly to us, uh, people would young adolescent boys would go there to exercise naked, and middle-aged men would go there to talk about philosophy and argue with sophists and whatnot, right? So it was kind of, they were kind of weird places that we don't really have an equivalent of today. It was a mixture of philosophy and athletics. And uh, the academy was one of them. And then Plato came along and he founded his school there. And he would walk in the park and talk to his students. He had a building there. And also he was buried there. Like his, uh, his tomb was in the park. His bones are maybe still under the ground. They are somewhere I like to think. And so we have the ruined foundations there of some of the buildings. We think well, one's a palestra. We're not entirely sure what some of the other ones are. It's a nice area in the summer, but it's a poor area of Athens. And the government have just announced plans to build a new archaeological museum there, to landscape the park, to improve it for tourists. And we said we could just have a building adjacent to it, facing the park and overlooking it, and we use it as a conference facility. And I said, I'll tell you, here's another, here's a story within a story. In the 1970s, the American director and actor, Sam Wanamaker, went to London. And he thought, London's cool if you're an actor. This is where Shakespeare did his uh, plays originally in the Globe Theatre. Um, and Sam Wanamaker went to look for the Globe Theatre, and it wasn't there. Like, <laughs> they found a little plaque. It said, this is roughly where we think the Globe Theatre might have been. And Sam Wanamaker thought, that's pathetic. Rightly so. He thought that that's is crazy. Why don't they just build a replica of it? It would be an amazingly unique building. It's a thatched roof and it's round, it's open air. It's like a really bizarre thing. And people thought he was crazy. He spent decades fundraising for it and he built the Globe Theatre on the south bank of the Thames. And it's now one of the main tourist attractions in London. It's got exhibits and an event space and a restaurant and they perform plays there and stuff like that. And so I said to the Athenians, well, I told them this story. And they understood it. And they were like, yeah, why don't we do that with Plato's Academy? Why don't we build at least a kind of event space where people can come and do philosophy? And then actually it would attract foreign revenue into right. Greece, which would be good for the economy and it would improve the, the area. So it's a non-profit thing, Charles. It's a social enterprise that would benefit the surrounding area. So that was the basic idea behind it. And then we realized it was going to take us a little while to do So people said, but Donald, there's a pandemic on. Have you not noticed? Like, and I was, and I thought, well, I like to see, I'm a kind of paradoxical guy. 
you know, I, I like to see what everyone else sees as a kind of setback. I like to think that maybe secretly it's an opportunity, right? So I thought, well, you're right, there's a pandemic on, but this is a good time to start this project because it's going to take us several years probably before we'd be able to open the, the premises and finish renovating them and stuff anyway. And the property prices are relatively low at the moment. So actually, it's quite a good time to begin doing this project. And in the meantime, we will get the virtual community off the ground. Like, can we build up our online presence so we can promote, do virtual events, and then promote the, the physical location when it's ready? And also in between, we, we because it's a park and because it's Greece, we can do open air events. And so the Athenian uh, local authority is organizing the summer, some open air events, which we've been uh, talking to them about participating in. So that's the yeah. whole story, Greg. There you go. Well, we should mention, so for anybody who's listening who wants to be able to see what Donald's talking about, platosacademy.org. Very simple, straightforward web address. And um, there's a lot more to the story, I, I think. But I, I do want to ask you about something. So when I was looking at precisely what you're talking about, this um, well-structured, we're going to do this first, and then that's going to lead to this, and then to this. It seems like um, you're, you're planning on not only looking for you know, support, both from governments and from individuals and institutions, but you're, you're thinking about how to use um, what you're taking in as revenue to push things through to the next steps. And so the, the, two, the two things that came to mind for me, especially knowing that it is in an economically depressed area where this is probably going to bring some jobs in and, uh, you know, influx of money into the community, especially if you get foreign tourists spending money there. So there's, this is an exercise of prudence, which is an important virtue, whether for, we're talking about platonic virtue ethics or Aristotelian or Stoic, but it's also about building and benefiting community as such. And it strikes me that, you know, choosing to, to do it in a, in a place instead of like, you know, finding the poshest place you can possibly have for yeah. conference goers doing uh, not quite the opposite, but doing something where it's actually going to be in a community where I suppose some people would be like, ah, these philosophy people coming in, what are they, what are they actually going to do for us? I, I want to know that philosophy is going to be very practical. Um, that, that, that seems like a good thing to me. Well, there's a kind of Greek thing about that, I think, which is it seems to me, like, if I can make a generalization without offending, I don't think my Greek friends would be offended by that. I think they kind of agree. There's a kind of like, there's a sort of mixed feeling about philosophy in Greece. So some people are a little bit jaded with it because they, it's part like they, they get a bit of it at school and in their upbringing and stuff. And they think, oh, I've kind of hit, not philosophy again. <laughs> like, you know, we've heard, we've heard all that you know, kind of before. But there's another current in, in Greek culture that, that's extremely proud of its heritage. Um, and so kind of uh, Greek people often tell me, they'll go, oh, Greek people aren't interested in philosophy. Nobody's really into that anymore. But then every, almost every single one of them that I've spoken to, like, get, is really into it. And I tell that to my Greek friend, I go, well, all the other Greek people I speak to, I can't get away from them. They're standing for hours, try to get my hair cut or whatever. Or buy a pair of underpants or something, and they're talking to me about Pythagoras and things like that. You know, like <laughs> I can't get trapped. Like, and they go, "Well, that's just the people you speak to, though, Donald." And I'm like, "Well, I don't know. I don't think that's true." Like, every so far, virtually every, and I met quite a lot of Greeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, almost every one of them that I've met. I think it's almost like they're kind of concealing the fact, but secretly underneath, like you know, they're actually quite passionate about philosophy and stuff. So I think maybe some people have mixed feelings about you know, foreign businesses and, you know, maybe the commercialization of it. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important that this is a non-profit organization and we're doing it in collaboration with local institutions. Um, yeah. And we have a number of Greek individuals uh, on our board of advisors or a board of directors and stuff like that. We try to kind of do that from the outset. But I also think it's important that, and I think the Greeks that I spoke to kind of sympathized with this, that I felt it, it, it made sense that it would be partly people from outside Greece that would kind of have some suggestions about the way to go about doing this. Because I think what the Greeks feel is that they have all these amazing assets, cultural assets, but they've struggled for years to know how to, for want of a bit, kind of better words, a bit of a crass way, a bit of it, to kind of monetize yeah. them basically or to, or to actually 
use them in a way that would benefit the economy. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. the Acropolis Museum, they've done a, re- a good job of turning it into a, a major tourist attraction. Um, but things like Plato's Academy Park is, is world famous, and yet it just kind of like sits there and tourists don't really come to it. And so they kind of want to know, like, what would Americans or British people or whatever want? Like, what would make them come here? And so I think I, I was maybe able, and my, some of my friends were able to bring a little bit of perspective uh, to the, the sort of things that might be appealing from an outsider perspective. Is, is there going to be, so, I mean, Plato's Academy, the one of the main, um, you know, gymnasia, um, is there going to be anything connecting down the line to, you know, the Kuno Sarges or, you know, the Stolpoikile or, you know, the... You can Andrew. join them all together. Well, well I, I, I could join the dots of, like, archaeological yeah, like, like sites. Maybe, maybe there'd <laughs> like, be, like, a tour to go a out. A secret tunnel. Yeah. Like, the they, yeah, the Lyceum. Like, well, the thing is that they didn't like each other. So they're quite <laughs> spaced apart. <laughs> like, so, like, I mean, I don't know if you like... I, when Aristotle opened his school, he did it on the other side of Athens right. from Plato. Like so, they they're, they're kind of like they speak, they try to get as far away from each other as they could for some reason. Well, how, or maybe how, it's just for those of us who haven't been there. How far are these from each other? Oh, not like is I it, mean, well, it's a modern city, so you kind of got to get through the city center and stuff. Okay. So you might your main problem is you might get stuck in a traffic jam for ages or whatever, right? <clears throat> but as the, as the crow flies, I guess where would we go to from the Lyceum to Plato's Academy? Is someone can Google this? I'm, I would think it's about just under an hour's walk 45 minutes okay but i'd say for maybe 45 i'm guessing about roughly 45 minute walk if you were able to to make a a straight shoot of it um which in modern times isn't that much but athens was much smaller actually you know back back in the day so that was the um outside the city walls and like the the other side of the city so um yeah, you could. I mean, I've often thought, for some reason, this is a recurring thing, that people are always like, what if you had a philosopher's tour and you could get in a little minibus and we could all drive around and like we could see where Socrates drank the hemlock and then we could like, go into the house <laughs> where Plutarch lived and like, yeah, yeah. you know, and you, yeah, you can totally do that. One of the weird things is there are, I think, people that do that. But generally, when you go to Greece, though, the, that sort of stuff isn't really highlighted. So without a shadow of doubt, most people who go there would look at the Acropolis and stuff and think that looks really cool, but they wouldn't really get much of a sense of how um, some of these locations link into the history of philosophy. So yeah, I can go, yeah. oh, by the way, I'll just, I'll give you a quick tour off the top of my head, right? Sure. Uh, yeah, it's kind of Sargis, awesome. there isn't anything there, right? We don't really, there's just a suburb there. There's, I don't think there's any archaeological remnants there, from what I recall. Plato's Academy Park, there are some ruins and the actual park is there and stuff. There's that. The Acropolis, there's the Theatre of Dionysus on the side where Aristophanes performed the class. Clouds. So the, you can literally see the, the the stands, the bench where Socrates is Socrates is sat. So Socrates, you can put your bum where Socrates' bum was, <laughs> like when he was watching this play, where they were roasting him, as we right, as the right. kids say today, like yeah. in public. On this, people would go there to to laugh at Socrates. So you can too, like, and you you some inter- you'll notice some interesting things when you do that, and then. Uh, where there's the Lyceum, which there's only a small part of the Lyceum now, but it's very well preserved. It's in a slightly more upmarket part of Athens. And the Lyceum, like in these parks were not, we associate them in a reductionist manner, Greg and Dan, like with, we think the Lyceum was Aristotle's school and the Academy was Plato's school, but that's not really entirely true because other philosophers taught there as well. Chris Ipus, Greg, taught at the Lyceum. And yeah. before Aristotle was a Johnny come lately, on the scene, like before he taught the Lyceum, Socrates discussed philosophy there. And Socrates probably went uh, and taught at the academy as well. And Prodicus, uh, oh no, sorry, Protagoras, um, read his famous, that, um, uh, is it On the Gods? The one where he says, I'm not really sure if they exist or not. And the Athenians were like, oh, we're not having that. Like, yeah. And they burned these books and put them on trial and all the like. So Protagoras, like this first kind of a, a, an agnostic kind of thing that got him in a lot of trouble, he, he read that at the Lyceum, as, as I recall. And uh, so you can go and see those things. And then just outside of Athens, maybe like uh, about an hour's drive from Athens, there's Elefsina or Eleusis, 
Okay. Where the Ellicinian yeah. mysteries were conducted. There's a sculpture of Marcus Aurelius, probably Marcus Aurelius, I think it's Marcus Aurelius, which was above the entrance gate because Marcus Aurelius was, um, that, that temple was looted by uh, a Sarmatian tribe um, that came all the way, rode down through the Balkans and looted it during the Markham Manor Wars. And Marcus Aurelius, when he went to Athens at the end of his life, said, I'm going to fix that, I'm going to have it repaired because I really like Ellis and Mysteries. Like it resonates with Stoicism. Yeah. And he built, rebuilt the gate at the front with a big statue of him above it. And that statue still remains, although the head fell off recently. Like, but you can still, you can go and check that, the big temple grounds there and everything in Eleusis. That's quite important to the history of philosophy. And then Delphi, where uh, Chirophon, Socrates' friend, that's a, maybe yeah. for them it would be a couple of days' journey. I think it's, what is it, two hour, two and a half hour drive okay. from Athens into the mountains. There's the Temple of Apollo, um, where the Pythia, the priestess um, of Apollo, would sit on the tripod and inhale the fumes and say, No man is wiser than Socrates, and everybody would have a good laugh. Like, and then, a, and then a, a few years later, they, 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 they'd be like, this joke's not funny anymore. Like, make them drink hemlock. And, and you, know, the, you, know, you know how the rest of the story, exactly, like, yeah. how it all ended. But that, she was very important. I think the Temple of Apollo is far more important than people realise to the, the history of philosophy. Plutarch says it was. Like, he said, the, um, we're told by a number of sources that Pythagoras learned his moral philosophy from one of the priestesses uh, at the Temple of Apollo, uh, one of the Pythias. Um, now, that's interesting because there aren't many, people keep saying there aren't many women in ancient philosophy, but mm. there are, but they're all kind of on the periphery yeah. in these kind of, then they're the most interesting characters. Like, so it may be that one of the very earliest moral philosophers, we're told, was not Pythagoras, but sort of the woman that taught him. Like, and it came from the god Apollo, because the god Apollo spoke through her. And the two most famous maxims every philosopher knows, Greg, like, there were 147 Delphic yeah. maxims. They're like Zen koans, because many of them are just two words in Greek. And Plutarch says, although they're very short and sweet, they're just like little seeds, they're cryptic. Many volumes of books have been written explaining them. So they kind of were just little strange ideas that, that triggered all this reflection. It's what fueled philosophy, trying to understand these things. And the two most famous ones were Genothai Seauton, which means know thyself. And made an agan, yeah. which means nothing in excess. And those were the ones that were carved in the pillar before you even went in. And the philosophers would argue about what they mean. Now, know thyself is obviously like a kind of a motif of ancient philosophy, particularly oh, yeah. Yeah. in the Socratic tradition. But so is made an agan, nothing in excess. The idea of temperance and moderation is, is very much a, a, a motif in, in throughout ancient moral philosophy and in Greek culture, even today, it's something that people um, often refer to. So this, this temple of Apollo was churning out these kind of seeds of philosophy. Yeah. Like, and kind of, it was this kind of factory, kind of like sort of fueling the philosophy industry. Like, so you can go there and you can look at that. It's an amazing archeological site. And then uh, those are like, I guess, I've probably forgotten some ruin now that I'm gonna get into trouble for not mentioning, but those are like those are basically the well, main ones of philosophical. Coming, in, coming back to Athens, what is there still left of the Stoa Poikile? Is there anything or no? Because people keep asking me about that, right? And I try to explain this without being too blunt about it. So they say, why do Plato's Academy? Why not do the Stoa Poikile? Well, I was right? going to ask you about that. <laughs> there's nothing there. Like it's a big <laughs> dirty hole in the ground, right? So we we have. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it is there. I don't mean to be dismissive of it. Right? No. It's a very important. It's an important archaeological site. The problem is, like the Athenians mm -hmm. built the city center on top of it, like so, and they built a railroad next to it as well. Like so, the there is a, um, a what do you call it? a plot that that's been excavated, okay. surrounded by tavernas and shops and stuff like that, in the the tourist uh, district. And there's not much to see. There's a few kind of ruins, but you can't you can't walk in it normally. Um, so you just have to kind of look through. You peer through a fence, and there's oh. like a lot of graffiti and a few cats and stuff like that. So it's not like you can walk. The ancient agora, you can walk all around. Oh, I forgot to mention, the ancient agora is one of the most important locations in terms of history. Yeah. Um, at the foot of the Acropolis, because Socrates obviously did philosophy there. Socrates, we think, actually um, was tried and, and executed 
in a building in the Agora. And uh, I mentioned earlier, like, satires. So well, I'm, I'm digressing slightly, but one of the things that's always a, I find fascinating about history is you know, our historical texts are very unreliable, right? And so historians will read things like satires and they'll think, well, that looks like it's probably not true. You know, yeah, like, yeah. I mean, he's, this guy said that, but we can't really trust it. So there's this legend about Simon the Shoemaker, who was supposedly good friends with Socrates. Socrates was known for going into tradesmen's workshops. They say he would hang out in the cobbler's shop in the Agora, talk to this guy, Simon. He supposedly wrote some of the earliest Socratic dialogues that are all lost now. Because it wasn't just Plato that wrote them. There were oh, loads right. of Socratic dialogues yeah, in circulation. Yeah. It was like a whole genre after his death. And Simon wrote some of the first ones. But people think this looks like a literary trope because Socrates is well known for going barefoot. So the idea that he spent all day in a shoemaker's shop just talking, you know, trash about philosophy, and then this guy, poor guy, is sitting there thinking, would you just buy a pair of sandals and then leave? These, like, are, these are people, though, who have never spent much time, like, sitting in a barbershop or maybe that's true, in a coffee right. house or things like that. Because it, it, you're, cons you're, you're constantly beset with people who are, you know, just sitting around, not purchasing anything. Yeah. You get, they get their hair cut eventually, yeah, though. Yeah. Right? <laughs> he didn't even ever bought a pair of shoes once. And so people thought, this sounds made up. Like, it sounds convenient as yeah, yeah. Well, they found, the arche the archaeologists found um, a little shop. They found lots of little shops. And one of them, they found nails for making boots. Okay, like, yeah. Like, and they thought, this is a cobbler shop. And then they found the bottom of a kelix, like a Greek uh, cup. Um, and sometimes Greeks would carve their name, scratch their name on the like terracotta base of the, the kelix. This one had the name Simon scratched on it, which wow. is quite eerie. Like, imagine being the guy that takes that out of the ground. Yeah, thinks, yeah. This is like a cobbler shop. Holy, this is good. Simon's written his name on it. It's almost <laughs> like someone's done that. Like, like, let's fake it. We'll scratch Simon on it. it. <laughs> told the archaeologist, right? So like, it's literally got the guy's name written on it. Like, and you can see that in the, uh, I think it's uh, exhibited in the uh, yeah. uh, Museum of the this... Ancient Agro. But I'll tell you uh, one other little thing about that. In the place where they think Socrates was executed, you can see this on a, a, being exhibited in the museum there. They found a statuette of Socrates of the kind that would normally be displayed in a shrine. So oh, it's, wow. And the Athenians did this sometimes. It's almost like they felt guilty about executing him and then built a shrine to him later in the, in the prison, they had a little statuette dedicated to him that they, they found in the, in the ground there. Well, that's not a surprise. So, oh, go ahead, Dan. I was, I, and then uh, I'll ask, a, I've got a question this raises for me. Yeah. Uh, so it, I think the, the choice, especially the, the Plato's Academy, is uh, a great one, especially when we're talking in reference to uh, Shakespeare and the uh, Globe Theatre. Um, you can't get anywhere in the Western philosophical tradition without talking about either Socrates or Plato. You either have to uh, like either affirm or reject him, but you can't just ignore him. Um, or if you ignore him, then that is also taken as you're intentionally ignoring him because how could you not? Right. I um, agree with that. Yeah, I think uh, he's, and, he's the elephant and, in the room or something. Like Plato's always yeah. there. He, he's the alpha exactly and so it, it it makes perfect sense um from a like at least a marketing standpoint that uh not only is anyone that's interested in greek philosophy but anyone in the phil uh, the western philosophical tradition has to have at least some idea of what this uh, these uh philosophers uh, plato and socrates were um and have to reference them and so it, it's in my mind it's more uh has more potential than even the acropolis yeah, I've only ever met one guy that had never heard of Socrates, and he was Australian. I don't know if that says anything. About it. I want, I want general, like, like, but that was that's just like that, that's the fact. I met this guy once, and he was an Australian buddy of mine, and he's like, I was talking about Socrates, and he was like, "Who's that?" And I was like, "How can you?" But Socrates, the Greek philosopher, like, he's never heard of him, mate. Like, and that's yeah. the only guy I've ever met that was just straight up. Everyone's heard of Plato, but everyone's everyone's heard of even everyone's heard of Plato's Academy, and even if they hadn't, Dan. Well, you'd be like, you've heard of academies, right? right like right. the common noun, <laughs> right? And they'd be like, well, yeah, obviously. And they'd be like, well, it's named after the, the like, the, literally the name of the place where the thing is, do, do, do. Yeah. Like, and so they, they, everybody understands what the academy is. And you go, look, even if you don't know anything about philosophy, do you not think it'd be pretty cool 
to be able to go and study stuff at the original archaeological ar well, archaeological location now, of literally the first academy after which every other academy is named. Now this and gets, yeah, you get this, to have kebabs and you get to go and swim like, with the fishes in the ocean and enjoy nice sunshine and all that. And so a lot of people are like, yeah, that sounds like a cool holiday. But basically, they don't do philosophy. There's not much philosophy going on there anymore, really. And, you know, part of the idea was very simply, could we not get people doing philosophy there again? Yeah. And, and this, what, what type oh, of philosophy? What type of philosophy? Uh, That's certainly, the question. What, what, right. Yeah. Like, from what I've read so far of your stuff, it, it seems that you've got the idea for conferences and, like, kind of like a, a general place to meet. Um, but are we There's a course actually going to go back to the idea of more than just discourse, but also um, any sort of uh, teaching going on? Yes and no. Like, because for, there are there are some legal um, oh, and kind of right. pr practical obstacles to starting a school. So at least in the interim, it's easier for us to run conferences than to create a teaching establishment, right? But there may be ways to work with that, let's say. So there's some complications that are kind of legally and practically because of the bureaucracy of uh, I think how things work in Greece. The conference option is easier. So in terms of teaching philosophy, I think one of the obstacles, so all great ideas, you think, why hasn't someone done this already, right? And the answer to that is because if somebody had done this already, they would have got a professor in philosophy from one of the Greek universities to give a PowerPoint slideshow about <laughs> Plato's theory of forms, yeah. right? And nobody would fly from America to see that, I think. Well, not many people, Greg would, but nobody else would, <laughs> right? And you, would you, Dan, come on a plane all the way? It's like 12 hours yes, or something yes. like that to see. You would do, okay. Well, you guys would. <laughs> I'm an outlier. Like, not, not that many people like, would do that. So right, I right. said, look, the thing is, we have to use Plato as a Trojan's horse. Right. I'm the, this is a secret. Don't tell anyone this, right? Well, you're on the air talking about it. <laughs> but don't tell anyone else, right? But we're using Plato as a kind of Trojan horse. And do you know what's inside that Trojan horse, Greg? Can you guess what's inside it? Not sure. What's, what's hidden inside? It's not Odysseus. It's Socrates. Socrates is hidden inside yeah. that Trojan oh. horse of Plato, right? Because I don't have a problem with it, because right? our main source, not our only source, obviously, but we have Xenophon and all that stuff as well. But our main source for Socrates is Plato. So we say that you came for the Plato, but we stayed for the Socrates kind of thing, right? <laughs> so I'm not, I don't want to bore people to death with Plato's theory of formas. We can right, get people right. discussing that and stuff, but it's not something that lights modern people on fire, really, because poets and mystics love it, but people don't see Plato's theory of forms as being a down to earth pragmatic philosophy for well, modern living. And it's also something that you don't have to be somewhere to do, right? I yeah. mean, you could, you could talk about Plato's theory of forms anywhere. So, yeah. So I think so what, what we want is the method, right? We want the Socratic method, like we want dialectic. Yeah. And I also, I'm going to say something else. There's paradox, like Socrates, there's paradox within paradox here, right? I'm going to suggest that it's not just the kind of cognitive aspect to the methodology. It's like the questioning technique and stuff like that. That's important. But I'm going to say, I agree with something that Epictetus said. That another weird, Epictetus was a weird guy. He said a lot of weird things, right? So yeah. he said, because he said, for example, one of the weirdest things he said, there's a passage in the discourses where he tells his students that living like a beggar is good for your health, because he said, look around you and notice how many really old beggars you see. <laughs> right. And he goes, like, it must be good for you. They wouldn't live to be that old. Right. Which is one of the most bonkers arguments like I've ever kind of come across. Right. 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 But, so he did say some really <laughs> weird stuff, but he says something shocking about Socrates. He says to his students, what is this, um, you know, like uh, 400 years, 500 years, like uh, after the death of Socrates. He says, so Socrates is like ancient history to him. He says, he's still going on about the guy, right? And Epictetus turns to his students and he says, you guys should be like Socrates. Repeatedly, he tells them that. And he says, you know that. He says over and over again, like you should live like Socrates. You should try and be like Socrates. Um, and he said, he, they say, can you, are you a sage, chickily? At one point, they say, hey, teacher, are you a sage? Like, and he says, I'm not, but I can point to somebody who might be. And then he talks, if I remember rightly, he references Diogenes and Socrates. So he's obsessed with Socrates. He's a yeah, massive yeah. fanboy for Socrates. And then he tells his students, you know, one of the main things that you guys could learn from Socrates, and they're like, no, go and tell us, has it got something to do with being really old and being a beggar and all that? Like, because we're not interested if it is. And he says, no, it's not that. 
Like he says, Socrates would show you how to be able to have a philosophical debate without it degenerating into a squabble, which many people would think is ironic because Socrates get executed for having philosophical debates, obviously, right? But yeah. Epictetus doesn't see the irony in that. He thinks Socrates is really good at having a debates with people without upsetting them. Now, that is kind of true. Paradoxically, this guy that's famous for being executed for upsetting people, generally in Plato, he's portrayed as being incred- having really good debating etiquette. He's, he's very polite. He's very generous, often. Um, he's very patient like, with his interlocutors in many cases, but he, he's, he has good humour about it as well. Like, that's one of the most bizarre things about Socrates. He's the most good humoured of all philosophers, in a sense. He's, um, a, you know, um, most relaxed. And Nietzsche uh, even commented on that. It, there's something about his character uh, and his sense of humour and irony that marks him out from other philosophers. Now, Epictetus says that's the main thing you could learn from him. Why do I think that's so important, Greg? Why do I think it's more important than Plato's theory of forms or even the the questioning aspect of the the structural aspect of the Socratic method? Well, because of the internet and the baneful effect that the internet has for a number of psychological reasons, social psychology of the internet is turning us all into, as you described, as you put it earlier, a-holes. (laughs) <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Like, so people go on the internet yeah, yeah. and they argue with each other. They're impatient, they're intolerant, they're incapable in many cases of having a proper rational debate. Like it's full of confirmation bias and other cognitive biases. They don't know how to frame questions well. Then nobody ever changes their mind about anything. Like, and so it ends up uh, uh, being the opposite of so- what the Socratic method was like. So what I'd like to do is bring back the civil discourse, like the tolerance of disagreement and those aspects of the Socratic method and, and as a, 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 a counterbalance in a way to, to what the social media has, has done to our culture. And so one of the things that you're talking about is having a virtual portion to this. Yes. And so I was wondering if you, like, is that something along the lines of Zoom, like what we're doing right now, or is that also something along the lines of maybe something more immersive, uh, something VR? Mm. Yeah, actually, that's something that we've been talking about. So we, there's always people that are very keen on the, the kind of meta uh, stuff and the like using virtual reality. That, yeah. that is a possibility. People are very interested in doing that in Greece, like reconstructing it virtually and also having virtual conferences and maybe video calls and things, but also text based. Like, I feel like we need to nail um, and we can nail, uh, you know, the just traditional text based. I don't think they're going away, actually. You know, contrary to to what uh, many people think, I think people will continue to use uh, discussion forums like they used bulletin boards oh, in right, the past. Yeah. They'll use video, they'll use virtual reality, but they'll still yeah. just type things. But I think people could learn to do that in a more civil, constructive, and tolerant manner. So partly there's this kind of civility of it, there's the etiquette of it, um, there's the, you know the questioning method, there's patience, there's tolerance, there's managing, it's all about the virtue of temperance in a way, it's about managing your anger and not getting upset yeah. by, with other people, <clears throat> not getting the hump with them just because they disagree with you, which is part, part, something that people are finding harder and harder today. Um, well, it's, but it's also about critical find... thinking in general. Sorry, Dan, I was just going to say, oh. we, are, we also want to teach people how to spot fallacies and stuff like that, right? So you, you almost never have a conversation where you're trying to talk about something that's especially deeply held. That you'll almost never see them change their their belief um, in a single conversation. That that that's rather unless they've already been doing something else. But um, it's, it's usually a, a number of dialogues if you want to actually change something that's really closely held. I guess there's a number of different. Um, kind of offshoots from the Socratic method that have uh, developed in the last couple of years. I know of like one's uh, the street epistemology, and they're very similar um, in this you know dialogue. But it's never um, one of the main things is you want both people to walk away from this conversation in the end feeling like that was a good conversation. They both had a good time. Well, how about that's what I'd like to do is, and there are a number of people recently that have been involved, and actually over the years in trying to bring philosophy, including the street epistemology guys. Uh, to the street level and focusing more on the methodology. Um, and so one of my dreams is to get all of these guys to come to a workshop mm. in Athens and brainstorm ways that they could kind of collaborate and come up with like a synthesis of certain aspects of their approach and 
you know, discard. Like the, 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 the alternative to saying, would you guys want to jump on a plane from America and fly and sit and watch a PowerPoint presentation about Plato's cave <laughs> would be to say, would you like to come for a weekend in Athens and do a skill, an intensive skills training and uh, Stuart yeah. epistemology or the Socratic method or, and we use the Socratic questioning, we use a thing that we call Socratic questioning in cognitive therapy, I should say, you know, like, you know, people out there, the cognitive, they're like screaming, they're all screaming at their, their, their computers right now, Greg, going, what about Socratic questioning in cognitive therapy? It's the main technique of cognitive therapy, it sort of is, like, so we do we do that, and also lawyers, and in different aspects of areas of education, Socratic questioning is a, a I, thing. And I find though that there there's a lot of people out there, especially in education, who say they're doing Socratic yeah. methods, Socratic questioning, and basically all it is is constantly asking questions. Yeah, and they they should spend some time reading Socratic dialogues, you know, from Plato and Xenophon. I know because they'd find out that actually Socrates does know a lot of stuff. He just yeah. deploys it in in kind of you know strategic ways, right? And also he has a method. He has quite a specific methodology yeah, yeah, for yeah. questioning people. Um, you know, and a lot of it revolves around these concepts of definitions. And uh, he he'll tend to. Um, you know, he'll, he'll try and identify exceptions. Like he'll, he'll, he'll demonstrate to people that their definitions are too broad or that right, they're too right. narrow. Like he's got a number of little strategies for doing that technically. It's a little bit different from the questions we'd ask in cognitive therapy. But then you like you say, there's other people that just use it to mean asking loads of questions. And that, that's yeah. not quite, so they're wrong, right? And yeah. so we could get them and we could say, maybe there's more to the Socratic questioning malarkey than meets the eye. Yeah. And maybe there's there, there's a philosophy behind it. There are values underlying it. And maybe there's also methodological uh, strategies like that you guys aren't aware of that could be verbal strategies that you might be employing cognitive strategies. Um, therapists, educationalists could benefit from that. Philosophers, everybody, like, I think, could benefit more from learning critical thinking techniques, including these questioning methods. So, you know, there was something that... that... A long time ago, you and I had a conversation, and I don't remember whether it was face to face or or over Zoom. And we were talking. You brought up the fact that so you you know you've been a cognitive behavior therapist for a long time. You've written works on it. Uh, you've you've given a lot of uh, talks, and you said nobody goes back and reads the literature of cognitive behavior therapy more than once. They're not going to go back and read Ellis's books or, you know, Burns's feeling better, things like that. But they will go back and read Epictetus's discourses or Seneca's letters or Marcus Aurelius's meditations over and over and over and over again. Yeah. And, and at that time you said, I'm not quite sure why it is. I think it has to do with the fact that there's a narrative there. There's like, you know, more, more robust things. And I was curious, because I think there's a parallel between this and what you're doing with Plato's Academy. Or there's something very robust happening there. Uh -huh. But going back to the thing about why people don't read CBT stuff like it's a classic, but they do read Seneca or, or Marcus Aurelius, do, do you have any further thoughts on that one? Yeah. What I said to you, Greg, was that people don't get tattoos Oh, right. Right. <laughs> right. And I thought I was kind of, I said that tentatively at first uh, uh, when I was giving talks and things like that. I was, I've never met anyone with an Albert Ellis or an RNT Beck tattoo. Yeah. And I thought, I'm, I'm going to look stupid here because eventually it's somebody's going to go, go yeah. hey, that's rubbish. I've got like Aaron Beck's face tattooed on my elbow. <laughs> or like that, right. And then I'm going to look stupid. I'm going to have to eat my words and stuff like that. But I've been saying that for like 25 years now. And I still haven't met this guy that's got, but someone might just go out and get one just to for the purely to mess with me now, right? Yeah. But I've never met anyone with an Albert Ellis tattoo or a, a CBT quote even really. I've met people with the Serenity Prayer tattooed on them. That doesn't count, <laughs> right? But I'm not going to give them that. But right, I've right. never heard seen anyone with like a quote from uh, David Burns's Feeling Good tattooed on their like you know, backside or whatever. But the, you've got, I mean, I don't know if you've seen how many people there are with Stoic tattoos, oh, starting, yeah, starting with Ryan Holiday, right? Yeah. But, like, everyone, like, there's a guy that's got a page where he just collects pictures oh. of Stoic tattoos. Like, there's loads of them, and people keep sending them to me. Someone got a tattoo of one of the illustrations from my graphic novel, and we haven't even published it yet. <laughs> there's a dude that's got a tattoo in his forearm, which is pretty wild. So, like... People get stoicism tattooed on them. Like, 
Now, it seems glib to say that, right? For which I don't apologise. But there's a deeper point to it, which is that these guys identify with us. It's not just like a technique to them. It's a philosophy. Right. I said that was one of the first things I said. Yeah. Oh, wait, I started wait, writing wait. about stoicism. Yeah, it's a way of life. Like when I wrote The Philosophy of CBT, which is my first book about this, um, and even when I first began giving talks and, and early articles that I wrote, I think the first article that I wrote was in like, two, I don't know, when was it? 2002 or something like that. It was a long time ago about stoicism. And I, like right at the very beginning, I remember saying a lot, look, th th it's amazing how much similarity and overlap there is between stoicism and CBT, right? And people are, oh, we hadn't thought of that. Like, it's a big revelation to us, right? But even then, I was also qualifying that by saying that they're not the same thing. Yes. By, because CBT, and CBT practitioners will be shouting at the computers when I say that's right, but CBT <laughs> is a bunch of techniques, right? And, well, no, it's not, right? Okay, it's a bit more than that, right? But to a large extent, it's a bunch of techniques, right? right, right, right. right. And there are reasons why, uh, because the Industrial Revolution, like so therapists have their niche like like the guy that you know puts the doors on cars in a factory or whatever mm -hmm. like it used to be everybody did everything right and then we have division of labor like and now psychotherapists and philosophers are two different people like whereas they used to be the same guy right like, so yeah like fact mm -hmm. right so now psychotherapists are like well, we don't do philosophy like we our job is we sit in a wee room with people that are upset. And I mean, obviously it's a little bit more complicated than I'm making it sound, yeah. right? But we sit in a wee room with like, without windows, like so it's kind of stuffy, like with people that are upset one after the other. And then we talk to them about their problems and stuff like that. And we teach them techniques and we ask them these questions and stuff like that. But generally speaking, we can't teach them a philosophy of life. And some therapists will be like, oh, that's not true. Yes, we do. Well, they're wrong, right? right because right. like you cannot, indoctrinate clients into moral values, right? There's a boundary, like circumscribed around the role of the therapist, like, yeah. and stoicism, like, and maybe people don't understand this, like is a moral philosophy, right? And I did stoic work with clients, but only when they would come and say to me, I've read a book on stoicism, Mr. Robertson, and I'm really into it, could I talk to you about it? And I'd be like, yeah, sure, but clients, people would say to me, so how do you do stoicism with your clients? And I would say, I don't. Because like, if right. they walk in the door and they're a Buddhist or a Muslim or a Christian or a Marxist or whatever it is, I don't say, sit down and start believing that virtue is the only true good and that'll make you feel better. Like, because is, they don't believe that. Yeah, This is a good place where we're going to have to come to a close. Um, wrap things up. We're, yeah, we're going to yeah. leave you the, the chance to go out on one of the, we always end with a, a passage and you've got two good ones here. So do you want to read them for us? Oh, we're very happy to have you on here too, by the way. So there's two quotes. You said I could have one, but I chose two from we the Meditations you. of Marcus Aurelius. So he says, a fine reflection from Plato, allegedly. One who would converse about human beings should look on all things earthly as though from some point far above upon herds, armies and agriculture, marriages and divorces, births and deaths, the clamour of law courts, deserted wastes, alien peoples of every kind, festivals, lamentations and markets, or agorai. So this is Marcus Aurelius describing what most people today would call the view from above. And then in another passage, he says, remember that your ruling centre becomes invincible when it withdraws into itself and rests content with itself. By virtue of this, an intelligence free from passions is a mighty citadel. For man has no stronghold more secure to which he can retreat to remain unassailable from that time onward.